Family squabbles are common and happen even between the closest members. But on a cold, snowy winter's night in northern Japan, a boy stormed out of his home after a heated family argument and was never seen again. This is the true unsolved vanishing of Tomohiro Sato. I was reminded of this particular incident as I shivered through the Japanese winter. There are of course many missing persons cases in Japan, but this one is one of the more famous examples in the country, despite being rather unknown abroad. I hope you find it informative. If you're a returning viewer or someone new to the channel, welcome. I make videos on Japanese cases, strange, solved and unsolved. If that sounds like something you think you'll find interesting, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications. In any case, let's get on with the video. From seeing comments of his classmates, 13-year-old first-year junior high school student Tomohiro Sato was a popular, happy boy. From a young age, he was very active and bright, and starting in elementary school, he participated in the school football team every day as a goalkeeper, for which he had won many awards and competitions. In addition to his sports prowess, he had excellent grades, earning him praise from his teachers and admiration from his fellow classmates. He had leadership qualities and took on the main role in his elementary school play, as seen here in this video. When asked by his mother what he wanted to do for a living when he grew up, he said he wanted to be a doctor because he wanted to make life easier for her. With this becoming his life's goal, he strived to take the entrance exam for the Asahikawa Junior High School, which is attached to the Hokkaido University of Education. This is a highly competitive local school, and he passed with flying colours. Clearly, he had a bright future lined up for him. But studies were not the only thing that occupied his time. One of his favourite hobbies was playing video games, especially on his Nintendo DS, which he had bought himself with money he'd saved up from completing chores and other means. He would also go out to meet his friends often in the neighbourhood. It seems he was very popular, and direct quotes from classmates include things like, he got along with anyone, he stood out, and he was always joking around. Tomohiro lived in an apartment in Asahikawa, Hokkaido, together with his 37-year-old mother Mai and older sister Ayaka, who was two years his senior at 15 years old. Since his parents had divorced when he was two years old, Tomohiro's father lived separately but still maintained contact with the family. According to the information we have available, the three members of the Sato family were very close. The mother worked a tough job as a nurse after the divorce and earned her care worker qualifications, but still made time for the children. According to her, Tomohiro always happily ate up all the food she made for the children. As an outsider looking in, things seem very normal and the family appear to be loving. But over 10 years ago as the making of this video, something would happen, something very bizarre. On the evening of Saturday the 14th of January 2012, Tomohiro had a heated argument with his then 15 year old sister Sayaka over the TV. He wanted to watch the movie Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, whereas she wanted to watch the drama The Perfect Son. They went back and forth screaming and shouting at each other over what to watch. Frustrated and wishing to end the squabble, Sayaka turned off the TV by unplugging the cord, so neither person would get their way. It ended the dispute, but instead of de-escalating the situation, this caused Tomohiro to become even more infuriated. He started throwing things around the house, kicking furniture, and punched a hole in his wall. Eventually, he took his Nintendo DS, the console he loved so much and saved up all his money to buy at such a young age, and smashed the screen, breaking it. He then threw it in a rubbish bin to be discarded. But this was just the beginning. On the evening of the next day, now the 15th of January, Tomohiro's mother Mai returned home from work. She saw the mess that her son had created in his room after the quarrel with his sister before discovering the Nintendo DS console in the rubbish bin. After shouting at her son to clean up his room, she confronted Tomohiro about it, saying, The screen won't turn on. Why did you break it? To which Tomohiro angrily replied with, I bought it with my own money, so I can do what I want. The two then had a heated argument, and Tomohiro snapped. According to Mai, her son would not listen to anything she said during the fight, and both of them just yelled back and forth. The mother was stressed from a hard day of work, and Tomohiro clearly had built up anger since the argument over the TV with his sister the previous day. Completely enraged, Tomohiro shut himself away in his room, slamming the door behind him. Mai and Ayaka could hear sounds of banging and shouting coming from within, which sounded like Tomohiro was kicking and throwing his possessions. Thinking it would be best to leave him alone for a while and calm himself down, Mai sat down to watch TV and left Tomohiro alone in his room to brood. Finally, at around 9.30pm, he walked out in silence, put on a thin jacket, and left the apartment via the front door without stopping. 
Believing that her son was simply going through the difficulties of puberty during his teenage years, the mother did nothing and let him leave because she thought that he was just going to cool his head. She wanted to give him some space, give him time to walk off his frustration. Little did she know that she would regret this mistake for the rest of her life. According to the sister who caught a glimpse of Tomohiro leaving, he was only wearing a jumper, a t-shirt and a thin jacket. He left in the middle of the night during a cold Hokkaido winter and on that particularly snowy night, the temperature was minus 15 degrees Celsius or 5 degrees Fahrenheit and sadly, he would never return. An hour and a half went by but he was still nowhere to be seen. The mother, understandably worried, looked out around the front of the apartment and called out into the night but he wasn't there. So she got in her car and drove to the nearest convenience stores and fast food restaurants to see if Tomohiro was in any of them since they were the only establishments open at such an hour and likely locations as to where he went. She peered into them from outside and also went in a few of them to check, but again he was nowhere to be seen. She then contacted the homes of Tomohiro's childhood friends and classmates via phone, but all of them said they hadn't seen or been contacted by him at all. They had no knowledge of what was going on. The mother then frantically started driving all around the area, hoping to encounter her son somewhere on the street. However, no matter where she looked, she couldn't locate him anywhere. In the early hours of the morning, now the 16th of January, she returned home in the hopes that he had returned during her absence or would be back soon, but he still never showed up. So eventually she went to the East Asaikawa police station to file a missing persons report and a search began the following evening. As touched on before, when he left the home he was wearing a thin black jacket but also grey trousers and white van sneakers with mismatched shoelaces. Such clothing was clearly not suitable for minus 15 degrees Celsius weather so the authorities launched a huge search. They suspected that something bad had happened and with the low temperatures they urgently began their investigation with that mindset. They set up helicopters to scour the Chubetsu River which ran close to the family home and groups of officers searched its banks. Searchers were also dispatched to the West Kagura Mountain to comb through the wild areas adjacent to the district. Local volunteers, including many of Tomohiro's classmates and their parents, also participated in the search. But again, despite all the people and resources put into the search, no one could find him. It was as if Tomohiro had just vanished into thin air. What could have happened to Tomohiro? Where could he have gone? And why wasn't he found? Well, let's discuss some key points and theories about the case. When Tomohiro left, he took his wallet. According to his mother, there was 1,000 yen inside plus change, so around 10 US dollars and roughly 3 or 4 300 yen bus tickets. He left his mobile phone in his room, however. Investigators quickly began looking into all possibilities in regards to transportation. They began with the buses. There are two bus stops in close proximity to Tomohiro's home. One to the western named Midorigaoka Shijo Ichome, which is the bus stop he used to travel to school and cram schools every day, and another to the east that is at the entrance of the area named Midorigaoka Iriguchi. The authorities went down to the bus company to investigate whether or not Tomohiro could have ridden on a bus. However, they immediately discovered that it was a dead end lead. He left his home at around 9.30, but the last bus at the west bus stop leaves at 9.03, whereas the last bus at the east one leaves at 9.25. Therefore, it would have been impossible for him to ride on one. For good measure, the authorities checked all the security camera footage of the buses, but he wasn't spotted in any of it. This included both footage of inside and in front of the buses. The bus drivers were also interviewed and all said that they could not recall picking Tomohiro up that night. Therefore, the bus was quickly ruled out as a possible mode of transport. Investigators also went to the local taxi company. Employees there told investigators that unreserved taxis very rarely drive through the area where Tomohiro lived, since it was a quieter part of the city and rather rural. The drivers were all interviewed, but all said they didn't pick anyone up that matched Tomohiro's description, and if they did, they would have certainly remembered it. They also claimed that, even if they had picked him up, 1,000 yen would not have been enough for Tomohiro to travel far from the area at all. Security footage of inside the taxis was also checked, but Tomohiro didn't show up in any of it. Like the buses, travelling by taxi was also ruled out. But what about trains? The last train leaves Midorigaoka station, the closest station to Tomohiro's home, at 11.01pm, meaning that Tomohiro could have ridden on the train even if he walked all the way to the station. The amount of money he had would have also allowed him to travel relatively far too, thus avoiding detection. 
However, again, the security footage at the station didn't show Tomohiro at all. Not just at the local station, but at all the other stations on the line too, such as Nishigorio Station. Plus, station and train staff were interviewed, and all said they never saw him or anyone that matched his description. No members of the public who travelled on the trains came forward either. So frustratingly, trains were also ruled out. Tomohiro's bike was left at his home in the exact place it always was, and therefore hadn't been touched that night either. So if he didn't travel via bus, taxi, train or bike, how did he travel? It was all a complete mystery to everyone. As is standard for such incidents, the family, volunteer organisations and the police created missing persons posters detailing Tomohiro. They included information I have already stated in regards to his appearance, but also other more defining features, such as his weight of 50kg, husky voice and birthmark. According to his mother, Tomohiro's voice was so rough that people often thought he had caught a cold, and the birthmark directly in the middle of his forehead was conspicuous even at a glance, and grew darker as he aged. Both of these things would have been very noticeable if someone were to meet him. These posters were put up all around the area and distributed around the local train station. The mother Mai was often seen giving them out to passers-by alongside other volunteers and officers. The Hokkaido Prefectural Police also made a missing persons page on their website for Tomohiro, which continues to be up to date. The authorities also interviewed Tomohiro's friends, especially his close ones who lived in the same apartment block. Tomohiro never went to their apartments and never contacted them at all. Employees at the local convenience stores and restaurants gave similar disappointing answers, and their security camera footage was checked just in case but revealed nothing. The authorities didn't give up however. Many news reports were run nationwide to spread awareness of the incident, and when the snow started to melt, another large scale search was conducted, since many believed that Tomohiro could have frozen and been kept hidden under the snow. Sayaka, Tomohiro's sister, also joined Twitter in 2015 and started posting about the disappearance to spread awareness. This led to many people all over the country sharing her posts. While the other search also sadly turned up nothing, the publicity of the event did eventually, three years after Tomohiro walked out of his home, result in an interesting lead. On the 30th of December 2015, in what appears to be a now deleted blog entitled, I Saw Tomohiro Sato, Someone wrote that they saw a person matching his description in a restaurant near Ikebukuro Station, Tokyo. They explained that they had seen a TV program about Tomohiro recently, which is why they could recognise the person. They said his face was the same as Tomohiro's photos, and that he had the same birthmark on his forehead. They then gave a description of the man's clothing, and explained that he was with a woman. Other people came forward with similar information, stating that a man following Tomohiro's description, birthmark included, was now working in Tokyo in areas like Kabukicho as a male host. On the website Nichan, someone wrote, I saw someone exactly like him in a Shinjuku Kabukicho host club. He had a birthmark on his forehead. According to the person himself, he ran away from his home in Asaikawa, Hokkaido. In fact, quite a few people said that they saw him in Shinjuku and some even had matching descriptions, such as that he had now had dyed brown hair and that he appeared to be working in the host industry. Of course, the authorities investigated these leads, but they never seemed to lead anywhere. Mai also went down to Tokyo with pictures of Tomohiro, and a convenience store worker said that he had seen him, but unfortunately nothing came of this also. The sightings did offer hope that he was still alive, however the authenticity of the sightings couldn't be verified. But things get a little stranger. The same year that many of the sightings occurred in 2015, Mai revealed in a TV show that she had mysteriously started to receive many silent phone calls on her mobile phone. She theorised that it could be Tomohiro just wanting to hear her voice but being too afraid to speak himself. And on the 15th of August 2016, Mai would receive a message on her phone. Something very alarming. Help. Tomohiro. She immediately went to the police, but since it was sent from a public payphone as seen from the text, it couldn't be traced back to a particular person or number. And this wasn't the only time it happened. Almost three years to the day on the 14th of August 2019, the mother received the exact same message again under the same circumstances. While it cannot be determined as to who sent these and what their intentions were, considering the times that they were sent and the content, it is almost certainly the same person. A prankster, or Tomohiro himself, we will never know. Naturally, with such a strange mystery such as this, with zero evidence or strong leads as to what had happened, theories and speculation flourish. Let's explore some of these theories. 
The fact that Tomohiro also wasn't caught on any security camera footage of nearby homes or businesses and not a single witness had come forward to say they saw someone matching his description that night makes it seem like, if he travelled by foot, he couldn't have gotten very far without something happening. He was not appropriately dressed for the below freezing weather and darkness of the night. On such a cold night, it would have been extremely dangerous for a young boy to go out while wearing such thin clothing. Even for a Hokkaido local who is used to such low temperatures, he would have only been able to walk so far without starting to freeze up. His hands and feet would have been particularly affected. Therefore some, including renowned former Hyogo police sergeant Itsuo Tobimatsu, who looked into the case for a TV show, believe that Tomohiro must have fallen victim to foul play or an accident soon after leaving his apartment. One theory is that he could have been taken by an opportune passerby and forced into a car. It was late at night, he disappeared mysteriously in an area where there are few people, and he was still in junior high school after all. Maybe some terrible individual saw their chance and pounced. However, some investigators consider this to be unlikely. At the time, Tomohiro was 165cm tall, and was quite physically capable due to his sports activities. Police believe that it is unlikely that he was abducted at random because he likely could have fought off his hypothetical attacker or run away. Also, due to his tall height for his age and the dark, he could have easily been mistaken for an adult, and therefore police didn't believe he fit the profile of children who are targeted for such acts. Usually it is elementary school children, not middle school boys such as Tomohiro. It is still a possibility, but the likelihood that such a person would be in the area at the time is considered to be quite low. Aforementioned Itsuo Tobimatsu also thinks this is unlikely, but he has a similar theory. He believes that Tomohiro stormed out in anger, but as he walked farther and farther into the night, the cold started to get to him. He then believes that a driver could have seen him, and rather than force him into the car, offered Tomohiro a lift to escape the cold. Maybe the driver offered to take him to the convenience store or even back home. Although unlikely according to the former detective, it could have even been an acquaintance and therefore someone trustworthy from Tomohiro's point of view. Tomohiro likely shivering and realising he was in trouble, could have gotten in willingly, not knowing that the driver perhaps had some dark motives. Speaking of cars, some have theorised that Tomohiro could have been involved in a car accident and the driver, likely in a panic, picked up his lifeless body, put him in the car and then dumped him in some far off unknown location. It was dark after all and Tomohiro was wearing black, so it is entirely possible that someone didn't notice him until it was too late. Also, seeing this news clip taken from in front of Tomohiro's apartment, we can see there are a few street lights. The authorities confirmed that no traffic accidents had occurred that night, but naturally if such a thing like this had happened, the person would likely have kept the accident a secret. This kind of thing has happened in Japan and elsewhere a few times, so it is not far-fetched at all. One famous case involved the driver taking an injured man, who was still alive, and throwing them in a forest in Matsusaka city where they eventually perished. A case for another video perhaps. However, in such a residential area, it seems a little unlikely since if Tomohiro was struck with a car, there likely would have been tire marks from braking, sounds of a thud against the car, and maybe some screams, blood or broken glass, and other drivers on the road. Another theory considered unlikely is that he simply managed to flee somehow and start a new life. This was touched on a little already with some of the Tokyo sightings previously discussed. We know that he only took around $10 with him that day, and didn't pack any other belongings, which isn't really consistent with people wishing to start a new life elsewhere. You could argue that he was very young, angry and not thinking straight, but he even left his mobile phone at home, which was near his wallet. You'd think he would at least take that to aid him. Also, he was only 13 years old, so such a thing, especially in Japan, seems like an impossibility, at least without help first. Speaking of Tomohiro's mobile phone and help, some have theorised that he could have called someone to pick him up. Some believe that he could have called his father that lived separately, who secretly took him in. However, phone records show that no correspondence took place, and the father had a solid alibi on that night, which could rule him, or anyone else for that matter, out of the picture. Others have theorised something else I've touched on a few times in this video, that he could have succumbed to the cold. Indeed, with how he was dressed, he was nowhere near prepared for the weather. In fact, after just 10 minutes of walking, he would have been in a dangerous situation. Some experts commenting on the case in news reports claim that he would have only been able to walk for 30 minutes or so until he was too cold to go any farther. The authorities don't consider this to be a likely outcome. 
Immediately upon the disappearance being reported, a huge search was conducted. They combed through the whole area with almost all officers available and like I mentioned, sent up helicopters. Local volunteers also aided in the search, and when the snow melted, another large scale search was conducted to make sure that that wasn't his fate. However, no body or other things were located. Similarly to this, some believe that he could have sadly gone to the nearby bridge and plunged into the river below. The river was searched extensively, but the currents could have taken him farther away. This is certainly more likely than a lot of other theories and usually the first many think of when hearing the circumstances of the incident, but many also find this questionable. As we already know, when Tomohiro left his home, he took his wallet with him. This along with putting on his jacket showed that he had likely intended to just pop to the convenience store to get away for a while before coming back. Some commentators say that things such as this are not seen in those willing to decide to perform such acts themselves. The river was also the main focus of the search from the very first day, so while it is possible something was missed, many have their doubts. And while Tomohiro had had some heated arguments in the lead up to his vanishing, he was, according to friends and family, a very happy, popular person who was gifted and had a bright future ahead of themselves. He didn't seem to be struggling with anything long term in particular, and so from an outsider's perspective, there doesn't appear to be a motive for going into the river. Before I get into the last theory, I want to preface it by stating that there is no evidence for it at all, and that the authorities strongly deny it as a line of inquiry. In fact, it seems to be born mostly from malicious Japanese netizens letting their imaginations run all over the place. Some have theorized that the mother and sister themselves were involved in Tomohiro's disappearance, and that the running away story was a fabrication. Some believe that he wouldn't have broken his beloved game console himself, no matter how angry he got, and said that he was abused until he snapped. Some allege that maybe the mother got angry and did something. To try and back up these baseless claims, they use this clip from a news show detailing the case. As the sister Sayaka talks to a reporter about the events leading up to the disappearance, the mother Mai can be seen peering at them from the background. Some have interpreted this to mean that the mother is keeping watch to make sure that her daughter doesn't say anything that she does not want her to. Or rather, to make sure that Sayaka keeps to their so-called false story. I think this is a bit of a stretch, to say the least. The same people claim that, instead of being out searching that night for her son, Mai actually took Tomohiro's body somewhere to dispose of it. But given how quickly she contacted the police, how forthcoming she was during the investigation, and how thorough the search was, again, it is not considered to be likely. The Japanese netizens regurgitating this theory also make harsh comments about the mother in regards to her makeup and eyelashes after she appeared on TV, saying things like she should spend less time on her appearance and more time looking for her son. So it appears that their allegations are more out of hate than anything. And unfortunately, that is where the case is right now. Sightings particularly focused on areas of Shinjuku in Tokyo continue to this day, but no true solid leads have come. The family continue to campaign to spread awareness, giving out leaflets and making TV appearances in hopes that somebody, maybe Tomohiro himself, will get in touch with the authorities. Some family members, such as Tomohiro's aunt, maintain Twitter accounts where they post messages to share information as well as message Tomohiro directly. Some of the tweets are really heartbreaking, including one where the aunt writes about Tomohiro's grandmother's passing and the hopes that he would get in touch. Sadly, while it is most likely that Tomohiro is no longer with us, I do hope that he is alive and that he one day reconciles with his mother and sister. And if he has indeed passed, I hope that his remains are discovered and that the family can finally have closure. Thank you for watching my 43rd YouTube video. If you liked it, feel free to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you wish to see more videos like this about Japan. It's tricky to say exactly what happened here since there are just no strong leads. The fact that there are a few sightings in Tokyo that often point out Tomohiro's birthmark give hope that he is still alive, but it is quite hard to believe that a 13 year old boy who spontaneously ran out of his home in the middle of the night with the equivalent of $10 could have done such a thing. As unfortunate as it is to say, I think it is more likely that he perished from the cold or from plunging into the nearby river. While the searches were extensive and therefore the authorities have their doubts, things have been missed in similar cases. Now that 12 years have passed, we may never get any answers, but I hope the truth comes out at some point, and that the family finally has the piece of closure. Anyway, that's enough from me. Until next time, goodbye.